All right, so we're going to pick back up with Chapter 3. Uh, we're almost done with Chapter 3. We're going to talk about calculating molecular weight and why that's important, how to use it. Um, and then we're going to talk about balancing chemical equations. I think that's pretty much it for this chapter. Okay, so first topic here today, we're going to talk about molecular weight. Okay, so molecular weight versus molar mass, um, atomic weight versus atomic mass. So what are these terms and what do they mean? Okay, so first of all, they're all describing the same thing. They're all describing what is the mass slash weight ratio, or what is the mass or the weight for one mole of something. Okay, so it's not a ratio, it's either or. Okay, so molecular weight, molar mass, atomic weight, atomic mass. These are all describing what is the mass or the weight of one mole of something. So for instance, if I have one mole of carbon atoms, I might ask, what is their mass? Okay. So you can say molecular weight or molecular mass. So the same thing. So in this case, we're talking about the mass or the weight of one mole of molecules, of, or of a molecule, I guess I should say. Okay, whereas if we're talking about atomic weight or atomic mass, then we're talking about the mass or the weight of just a one mole of atoms. Okay, so it's the sum of all the atomic weights of all of the atoms and the molecule. Okay, so we're going to use the unit grams per mole. And for instance, if we wanted to calculate the molecular weight or the molecular mass for water, so we're going to add the molecular mass of hydrogen times 2. Okay, so 1 times 2 is 2. Then the molecular mass of oxygen, which is 16. Okay, so that gives us 18. And our units are going to be grams per mole. Because remember the units on the periodic table, those are that gives us grams for a mole of those atoms. Okay, so when we add all these together, we end up with grams per mole of a molecule. Okay, so atomic weight or atomic mass is the atomic mass of one mole of the element. And again, the unit's still going to be in grams per mole. And if, for instance, you wanted to know the molecular mass for excuse me, the atomic mass for, uh, for copper. You're just going to take a look at your periodic table, find copper, okay, and you're going to get a molecular mass or an atomic mass of 63.5 grams per mole. Um, so if I make a mistake and say molecular mass instead of atomic mass, just understand that we're really talking about the same thing. So you kind of have to use some context there. If I'm talking about it in atom, obviously I mean atomic mass. If I'm talking about a molecule, obviously I mean molecular mass. But these are kind of in the real world used interchangeably for the most part. Okay, so suppose we wanted to know the molar mass of ethanol. Okay, so here we have C2H6O. So whether we're calculating the molar mass for ethanol, for um, an atom or a molecule that has a hundred atoms or a million atoms, the process is going to be exactly the same. Okay, so the first thing we're going to want to going to want to do is just to see what is in that molecule. Okay, so the first thing is we have two moles of carbon. How do I know I have two moles of carbon? Well, if I take a look at my formula, this two tells me I have two moles of carbon. Okay, so then I go to my periodic table. Okay, so if you can print a periodic table, um, there's one on the blackboard for you. That would be a great resource for you from now on. You're going to start needing it a lot. Um, or just have it as a PDF, like kind of close by, maybe something like that. Okay. Anyway, so I go to my periodic table and I find the molecular weight or the, excuse me, the atomic weight or the atomic mass of carbon. Okay. And remember that it's going to be in grams per mole. So oftentimes people write grams of carbon per one mole. You could write it like that. Okay. And then you're going to multiply the number of moles of carbon or whatever the atom is times its, its, its atomic mass. Okay, so here we do 2 times 12.01 which will give us 24.02 grams of carbon. 
Okay, so notice our unit here changes to grams because we're canceling out the moles here. Okay, and then we have six moles of hydrogen. And then just go to the periodic table, find the atomic mass of hydrogen, which is 1.01. .01. Okay, times six gives us 6.06. .06. And then do the same thing for oxygen. Okay, so this is all of the components of our molecule. Then what we want to do, so if we want to find the atomic mass for the, or the molecular mass for the entire molecule, we just add these together. Okay, so you could just write a little plus sign here, total those up. Okay, so the total molar mass is going to be 46.08 grams per mole. Okay, so I could say how much, how many mole, or how much does one, what mass does one mole of ethanol have? Okay, and you would say 46.08 grams per mole. If we're talking about a mole of it, we use grams per mole. If we're talking about one individual molecule, we might just use grams. Okay, so it depends on the context. But generally speaking, you're going to want to end up with units, or you're going to want to use units of grams per mole. That's going to be the most useful. Okay, so that's really all there is to it. Okay, so give these three a try. To see if you can do it. I believe in you. I think you can do it. Give it a try, and uh, we'll go over it in just a second. Okay, so let's take a look at these. So the first one, we have methane. Okay, so it has one carbon, four hydrogens. So all we have to do is find the molar mass for carbon. Okay, so 12 grams per mole. And then time is one, since we only have one of them. So we get 12.01 grams per mole. And then we have four hydrogen. Okay, so 1.01 .01 times four gives us 4.04. .04. And then just total those together they get 16.05 grams per mole. Okay, that's really all there is to it. Okay, so the next one, we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Okay, so you'll say 12.01 .01 times six. Okay, and I just put those numbers there to help you count. And then when we do the hydrogen, we have three, four, five, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, so now we'll do 1.01 .01 times 14. Okay, and then again, total those up. And that's your molar mass. Okay, the last one. So it, now we have something other than just hydrogen and carbon, but the process doesn't change in any way. Okay, we just have to go to our periodic table, find the atomic mass for iodine, find the atomic mass for fluorine, the same process again. So molar mass times two since we have two of them. And then we have seven fluorine. Okay, and then total them up. Okay, notice this is a pretty big number. That's okay. Some molecules are heavier than others. Okay, if you start putting transition metals in, especially late transition metals, these things got to get really, really heavy. So don't let that bother you. You know, if you end up with a big compound with mass in the thousands, that's possible. Just understand that if you have heavier atoms, you have a heavier molecule. Okay, so the main way you're going to use um, sort of molar mass, molecular mass, is we're going to use this to convert between the mass of an element to moles of an element. Okay, so you want to go from mass to moles. And the way you're going to do this is just to multiply okay, by one over the atomic mass of the element. Okay, so if for instance, well I think I have an example here for you. Okay, so if we have 24 grams of carbon, okay, suppose we wanted to know how many moles of carbon that was. And this is something you'll do a lot in chemistry. Okay, going from 24, from, from mass of something to moles of something, or from moles of something to mass of something. This is something that's quite common um, because you can compare moles of carbon to say moles of hydrogen. But what you can't do is you can't directly pair, 
mass to mass. Okay, so if we want to convert 24 grams of carbon to moles of carbon, what, we're going to, what we do is we multiply by 1 over the molar mass. So in other words, we know carbon has a molar mass of 12 point, let's just say 0, 1 grams per mole. Okay, and remember that when you have a unit like this, grams per mole, you can also write it like this. So going back to our dimensional analysis, Okay, so if this is the more useful form, we can use it this way. But in this particular case, we want to end up with moles, not 1 over moles. And we want to cancel out grams. So the way we're going to do this, we're going to say for every 1 mole of carbon, okay, there's 12.01 grams. Okay, and now if we take a look at this, so these grams will cancel with these grams, and we're left with moles. Okay, so if we multiply 24 times 1 over 12, that's going to end up giving us the number of moles of carbon. Okay, so in this case, we had 2 moles of carbon. The answer is not so important in this particular instance. What's important is the process. And we're going to look at going the other direction as well. Okay, but you need to set up your conversion factor. That's the best way to think about this, is just think about it as a conversion problem. Okay, so just remember that for every one mole of carbon, there's 12 grams. For every 12 grams, that's one mole. Okay, so you can just use it as a conversion factor either way around. Okay, so what if we want to go from moles to mass? Okay, so it's going to be a similar process. Only this time, we don't need to flip our conversion factor. We just use it the, straight from the periodic table. So we don't need to do one over. We, want, we need to do grams over moles. Okay, so an example, suppose we had eight moles of helium. We wanted to know how many grams that was. So this time, we keep our unit as grams per mole. Okay, so four grams per one mole. Remember, you can always put a one there. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just a placeholder. So yeah, one doesn't affect the math that we're doing in any way because we're not adding anything. Okay, we're multiplying and dividing, so adding a one here doesn't doesn't hurt anything. Okay, it's just a good placeholder. Okay, then we can cancel our units out. Moles of helium cancel the moles of helium. We're left with grams, and our answer is in grams. We were looking for the mass in grams, and that's what we got. Okay, that's all there is to it. So where did this come from? This just came straight from the periodic table. So if you take your periodic table out, and you find helium, you look for uh, the mass of one mole of helium atoms, you'll see that it's roughly four grams per one mole. Okay, so that's all we're doing. It's really no different than comparing or saying, you know, a dozen is uh, 12. Something like, it's kind of the same thing. It's just we need to know specifically for helium what that mass is. Okay, and we can do this. We can string several calculations together. Okay, so we can go from mass to number of atoms. We can go through the mole. Why can we go through the mole? Well, if you remember, one mole is Avogadro's number of something. Okay, so if we want to know how many of something we have, we go through the mole, use Avogadro's number, okay, and we can get to like how many atoms, for instance. So here we could say the mass in grams, okay, times one mole over the atomic mass. Okay, then we know that there's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms in one mole, so this will tell you the number of atoms. So here the grams would cancel with grams, mole would cancel with mole, and we'd be left with just atoms. Okay, remember Avogadro's number can be of anything. It could be of atoms, it could be of pencils, it could be of anything. So sample calculation. So the first step, and you can string all of these together, by the way. They don't have to be separate like this. Okay, so here we have 45.99 grams of sodium. And we want to know how many atoms of sodium that is. There should be a multiplication sign here. Somehow that got removed. Okay, so we're going to take this mass of sodium. And the first thing we want to do is multiply by 1 over the molar mass of sodium. Okay, or divide by, essentially we're dividing by the molar mass. But you can think about it either way. So 1 over the molar mass. Okay, and then somehow all of my multiplication signs got removed. Hmm. 
Okay, then that times Avogadro's number, and that will end up giving you the number of atoms. So these grams will cancel with these grams. Um, these moles will cancel with these moles. And you're left with just atoms of sodium. So suppose we wanted to go from the number of atoms to the mass of an element. Okay, well we can go through the mole again. So notice in all of these processes, we're going to use the mole as sort of a bridge. Okay, so here we have the number of atoms times one times or one over Avogadro's number. So this time we're putting Avogadro's number. We're putting one over Avogadro's number. And the reason we're doing that this time is because we're starting from atoms. So we want to end up with moles and then eventually mass. So first we're going to want to we we want to cancel out atoms. Okay, and then we'll multiply by the atomic mass. That will give us the mass of whatever we're talking about. So atoms would cancel with atoms, moles would cancel with moles, and we'd be left with just mass, which is what we're looking for. So an example calculation. So suppose we have eight atoms. So suppose we have eight atoms of americium. Okay, so we want to know how many grams that is. So the first thing we want to do is we want to convert from atoms to moles. And you can write out each step individually, um, but it's also perfectly fine to string these together. And you can use my, so I, I want to write this one out just for clarity here, um, just to show you one example, and we'll do a couple more. But So here, if I'm starting from, this is how I would write it, eight atoms. Okay, and I want to end up with mass. Okay, so I'm gonna I would use this method. And I would say, okay, well I want to get to moles, so I know that one mole is actually 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Okay, so that's one step. But I'm not to the unit I want yet. The unit I want is grams. Okay, so then I need to know, okay, what's the molar mass of this atom? And I want to cancel out moles. So I know that there's 243 grams per every one mole. It's handy to write out what it is you're talking about so that you don't get confused. Because sometimes you may convert between you know, this element to a different element or this compound to a different compound. Okay, and then you can just say equals. And you'll end up with the same answer. The way I would do this, punching in my calculator, 8 times 243 divided by 6.02 uh, times 10 to the 23rd. Okay, and that should give you the same answer. Either way you feel comfortable, there's no difference. It's just all about which one is better for you. Um, doing the dimensional analysis like this way um, will be more helpful to you in the future as you keep going through classes like this and throughout this class. But it's not necessary either. So if this Drawing the train tracks is a little bit confusing. I would recommend you get used to it, but if you'd rather do it with the X's and the multiplication signs, that's perfectly fine too. Okay, so that's how we would convert from atoms to mass. So here's a couple for you to try. Okay, so it says how many magnesium atoms are in 0 0.200 gram sample of magnesium, obviously. Okay, so convert mass to moles. And they give you the molar, ma the atomic mass here, and then they want to know how many atoms in this piece of magnesium. Okay, so give this one a try. Give me a pause. Give this one a try, um, and then we'll go over it together. For the first part, we just want to convert the mass. So we have a mass in grams. We want to convert this to moles. So what we need to do is to first go to our periodic table. In this case, they gave it to us. But if they did not give us a molar mass here, we would need to go find it. Okay, But they were nice enough to give us the molar mass. So all we need to do is take our mass in grams. And I'm going to write this one out again um, just to show you how I would approach this problem. Okay, So first, take what they give me. 
Okay, so 0 0.200 grams. Okay, and that grams of what? So that's going to be grams of magnesium. Now what am I looking for? I want to go to moles. So how can I go from mass of magnesium to grams of magnesium? Well, obviously they gave me the atomic mass for a reason. Okay, but this is the tricky part. Well, it's not tricky, but this is the part where you have to make a decision. So you have to decide which way around do I want to use this. Because remember, this can either be grams over moles, or I could flip it to be moles over grams. So in this particular case, I want to end up with moles on top. So I'll say for every one mole of magnesium, there's 24.30 five zero grams. Now I can check my unit. Oh, sorry. So I just want to see firstly, will I end up with the correct unit? So here my grams will cancel with grams. And what I'm left with is moles. Okay, and that's the unit I'm looking for. Okay, so now we just have to do the math here. And again, I would do 0 0.2 times 1. Obviously, you could kind of skip that. 0 0.2 times 1 divided by 24. And I believe I have the answer right here for us. Uh, yes. So 8.23 times 10 to the minus 3. sure that's correct yes okay okay so that's the first part now the second part we want to know how many atoms are in this piece of magnesium okay so we want to start from now we know how many moles it is oh don't forget your unit here this is moles I almost forgot okay so now I know this is that many moles so again I'll start from 8.23 times 10 to the minus 3 and this is moles so I want to get to atoms. So I'll set up my dimensional analysis again. And I know that for every one mole of, at of magnesium or anything, there's 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Let's just say 6.02. We don't have to put the 3 in. Okay, so now check our units. So moles cancel with moles. We're left with atoms. Good. Okay, so the answer here is 4.95 times 10 to the 21. And that's atoms. Let's squeeze this in here. Of oh, magnesium. Correct it a little bit better. Okay. So that's the two, the two answers here. And now we could also string these into one calculation. So you could always like put a, another bar and keep doing it. That's why this, this is a powerful tool. Okay, but you don't have to do it that way. You could do separate calculations. That's okay too. But eventually you'll get comfortable enough where you can string 10 of these together and not have a problem. Okay. So suppose we want to go from atoms to mass. We know we have to go through the moles. So we could say number of molecules to moles of molecules to the mass of the compound. Okay, so number of molecules, so it could be one, or it could be thousands, just depends. Okay, times one over Avogadro's number of molecules will tell you the moles of the molecules. Okay, so a mole of molecules times one over, so one mole, molar mass over over hold on this is a little bit weird let me just double check this real quick okay I see what they're trying to do here so if we want to know the mass of these molecules we'll take the number of moles of molecules times the molar mass to give us mass so moles cancel with moles and we're left with units of mass or molar mass in this case but these are this would just be grams okay so for example here Suppose we had eight methane molecules, CH4. We want to get to how much mass that is. Okay, so we'll take eight. So we have eight of them. 
And we're going to divide by Avogadro's number to get to the number of moles. So molecules cancel with molecules. We're left with moles. Okay, so this should be moles. Okay, then take the number of moles times the molar mass. So moles now cancel with moles, and we're left with grams. Okay, so we end up saying that eight molecules of methane is 2.13 times 10 to the minus 22 grams of methane. So these problems, hopefully you're picking up, they're all, essentially we're doing the same thing. It just depends on where are you starting from and where is it you're trying to go. And you can use your units to guide you. Remember the dimensional analysis part of this. So use your units to help you get to where you need to go. Okay, so let's try this. So same similar problem, only this time we're talking about molecules instead of just single atoms. Okay, so the, for the first one, they want us to convert molecules to moles. So we have this number of molecules, so 4.78 times 10 to the 24th, so lots and lots of NO2. Okay, so what's our first step here? We're going to multiply the number of moles, or the number of molecules, excuse me. Okay, so we want to end up with moles. So we want to end up with moles from molecules, so we're going to multiply by 1 over Avogadro's number. Molecules cancel with molecules. We end up with moles. Okay, that's what we're looking for. So we turns out that 4.78 times 10 to the 24th NO2 molecules is 7.94 moles of NO2. Now we want to know what is would the mass of that be. So very similar to what we just did. So take this number of moles, multiply by the molar mass. Moles cancel with moles. We end up with units of grams. Perfect. Okay, so 365 grams of NO2. So really, like I say, it's really the same problem. You're just looking at it from a different angle, that's all. And here, um, we're talking about molecules instead of individual atoms, but the only thing changes is you need the molecular mass and the molecular weight instead of the atomic mass. That's the only change. Okay, so hopefully um, those are becoming easier. Um, if not, Make sure you practice those. And while we're talking about this, it's very, very important that you get this down because this is going to be something you do very frequently in this class. It's just converting between units, converting from mass to moles, moles to mass. Like that's something you do constantly. Okay, so one thing we'll talk about so we'll talk about percent composition next. So percent composition is just talking about um, what percent of a molecule is that particular thing. So it says a pure compound always consists of the same elements combined in the same proportions by weight. Okay, we talked about that. So therefore, we can express molecular composition as percent by weight or percent composition. So for instance, ethanol's molecular formula, C2H6O, and it has a molecular mass of 46 grams per mole. So suppose I wanted to know what percentage of ethanol was carbon, or what percentage of ethanol was hydrogen. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. And it turns out, so these numbers aren't so important at this moment, but ethanol is 52, about 52% carbon, about 13% hydrogen, and about 35% oxygen. And I'll show you how we find that. Okay, so remember, whenever we're talking about percentages, the main thing we're talking about is the part divided by the whole. Okay, so we take some fraction of it and we divide it by the total. Okay, and then we multiply by uh, multiply by 100 percent, and that gives us a percentage. Okay, so let's take a look at one of these. So let's look at water. This simple example of water. Okay, so suppose we wanted to know what percentage of water was oxygen. And we would expect it to be a rather high percentage. Okay. So first thing we need to know is we need to know the molar mass or the atomic mass of all the atoms, so oxygen and hydrogen. And notice we want the total mass that's in the molecule. Okay, so we do one times or two times one 
for hydrogen and one times 16 for oxygen. Okay, and then we add those together and we get the molar mass of water, so around 18. Now what we want to do, if we want to find just the percent of oxygen, we take the part, okay, so the part, that's oxygen, divided by the whole, which is the total molar mass. Okay, so in this case we're going to do uh, almost 16 divided by 18, and then times 100% to give us a percentage. Okay, so divide those, multiply by 100, and it turns out oxygen or water is about 88.8% .8 oxygen. And that's all there is to it. So I could have asked you about um, any molecule in this way and asked you, I could have asked what's the percentage of hydrogen. You would do the exact same process. Okay. So here it says, determine the mass of table salt containing 2.4 grams of sodium. So how do I do this one? Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to find the percentage of sodium in sodium chloride. Okay, so I know sodium has an atomic mass of about 23. So a mole of salt has a molecular mass of sodium chloride salt, has a molecular mass of 58.44 grams, so that's just the atomic mass of sodium plus the atomic mass of chlorine. So therefore, if I want to find just the percentage of sodium, I'll say 22.99 grams of sodium, okay, divided by the whole. This is written out a little bit differently, but it's the same process. Okay, so we'll go from grams of sodium, okay, then times 100. So just divide, or let's say take the mass of sodium in sodium chloride, divide by the total molar mass times 100, and that will give you the percent of sodium and sodium chloride. So that means if there's 100 grams of sodium chloride, you have 39.34 grams of sodium. Okay, so now we can set up a ratio. So we're going to make this assumption, 100 grams of sodium. Okay, just for sake of comparison. Okay, so that we can set up a ratio. So set up a ratio, set up the mass of sodium chloride, you have 2.4 grams of sodium. Okay, so we'll say 2.4 grams of sodium over x grams of sodium chloride is equal to 39.94 grams of sodium over 100 grams of sodium. So essentially what we're doing is this. We're saying the mass of sodium, the 2.4 over, this is what we want to find out. We want to know how much sodium chloride has that mass we're saying this. So we're saying 39.94 grams of sodium is in every 100 grams of sodium chloride. Okay, then you can just cross multiply and then solve for x. And if you solve for x, you should end up with 6.1. Okay, so this is useful sometimes if you are uh, maybe using a chemical that has the percentage rather than molarity, or if you're um, talking about making a 10% solution of something, something like that. That's my, when this might be useful. Some, but it's good to know. Okay? And so in case you see it, now you know how to find the mass of something that would contain that much of that particular atom. Okay, suppose we wanted, this is probably the more practical way of using this. So suppose we wanted to find the mass percent of chlorine Okay, in this molecule, C2Cl4F2. So the first thing we need to do is we need to determine the molar mass of this compound. So just like we did before, find the molecular mass. So 24 plus 141 plus 38. So we find the individual molar masses just like we did before. So 2 times 12, 4 times 35, 2 times 19. And then remember, these numbers are coming straight from your periodic table. This is just the number of those in the molecule. Okay, so find the total molar mass, the molecular weight. Okay, then find the mass of chlorine. So in this case, we'll do 4 times 35. And then just divide. So if we want to find the percentage of chlorine, okay, we'll multiply or divide 141 by 203, which is the total molar mass, times 100%, which gives us about 69% chlorine in this compound. Okay, so make sure you can... If I give you any molecule, make sure you can determine the percentage of a particular atom in that molecule.
Okay, so let's take a look at one way um, percent composition is used. Okay, so one way we can use this is if we want to determine an empirical formula and a molecular formula from percent composition. And this will often be done through a method called CHN analysis, which is a combustion analysis technique that tells you the percent of CH and N, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And it can look for other elements as well. But this is often used as sort of some extra evidence to show the purity of a compound if you have other data to support it. So you have lots of data that says, yes, I made this compound. This is one way to support its purity. OK, so what's the strategy here? So the first thing we need to do is determine the empirical formula from the percent composition. OK, so how do we do this? OK, so to determine the empirical formula, we want to convert basically percent to mass, mass to moles, and divide by the smallest. Okay, and I'll, I'll break this down even further, but these are the steps basically. So convert the percentage of something to the mass of something, convert that mass to moles, and then divide by the smallest, and if it should come out with a whole number, if it doesn't, you can multiply to get to whole numbers. Okay, so this strategy gives you the empirical formula. Let's see. So to determine the molecular formula, so suppose you find the empirical formula and you want to find the molecular formula, you also need the molecular mass. Okay, so you would need that inf piece of information in order to determine the molecular formula. Without that, you can't do it. So once you have the empirical formula, so determine the unit mass of the empirical formula. In other words, just determine what the molecular mass of that empirical formula is, even though we know that's not the real molecular formula. Just find the molecular mass. Okay, then divide that mass by the empirical formula, or I'm sorry, divide the mass of the empirical formula by the molecular mass of the compound. So that's the true molecular mass. Okay, so this would have to be given. Okay, and then you should end up with a whole number, which will tell you what to multiply the empirical formula by to get to the molecular formula. So I know this probably sounds kind of abstract without seeing it done. So I think we have one here. Yeah, let's do this problem. Okay, so it says a compound, it just says B, so boron, so it has 81% boron, and hydrogen has a molecular mass of 53.3. And they're asking us to determine the molecular formula. So I'm going to walk you through this problem. Okay, so this is just a little note paper app here, notebook app. Okay, and let's just walk through this problem real quick. Okay, so I'm going to copy in the information they gave us to notepad, and that will give us, remind us what the numbers are. Okay, I need lots of space for this, so I'm going to do it this way. Okay, so they want us to find the molecular formula for this compound. Okay, so how do we do this? So hopefully this will be a little bit easier to understand than it was in text form. I know that probably was a little bit abstract. So let's look at it with some actual numbers. Okay, so the first thing we have here. So we have that this compound made up of boron. It's 81.10% boron. Okay, and we know that it also has some hydrogen. We don't know how much hydrogen. I'll show you how we find out in just a second. We don't need the second B over here. And we know that it has a molecular mass, 53.3 grams per mole. Okay, so what are we going to do with this information? First thing we need to do is to figure out the percentage of hydrogen in this problem. So if we know that the whole compound is 100%, we know that it's at least 81% boron, I can do this. Okay, so what that leaves us with 
is 18.9. That leaves us with is 18.9, just nine zero. Yes, nine zero percent hydrogen. Okay, so now I know that piece of information. Okay, so this is no longer an unknown to us. Now we know that I have 18.90% hydrogen. So what I don't have yet still is I don't have a mass. So sometimes in chemistry we need to assume a mass. And as long as we're consistent with that mass, then we can do this. So what we'll do for this problem, just to make our lives easy, let's assume that we have a 100 gram sample. Why 100 grams? Well, because if we multiply, so if we wanted to figure out the mass of 80, so if I have a 100 gram sample and I have a percentage of boron of 81.1%, well then I also have a mass of boron of 81.1. Okay, so you could think of it this way. So do 100 grams times, and now convert your percentage to a decimal, so 0 0.810. What's this going to be? Well, it's just going to move the decimal back over. So literally, you end up with this number. Okay, So this is this much boron. And then likewise, you can do the same thing. So 100 grams times 18.9. So we now know that's what percentage it is. Well, we want to convert it to a decimal. Okay, You can't multiply it by a percentage. You have to convert it. So again, this is going to be 18.9 grams of hydrogen. <coughs> okay. So now we have the mass. So what is the next step? We need to calculate the number of moles of each of these. Okay, so we need to go to our periodic table, find the molar mass. Okay, so I'm just gonna scoot this up a little bit for us. So it's best to do these stacked on top of each other. So we have 81.10 grams of boron, and we have 18 0.90 grams of hydrogen and we want to convert these to moles okay so I'm going to set this up okay so the molar mass of boron 10.81 grams so for every one mole of boron there's 10.81 grams okay and if I do this math I end up with 7.502, 7.502 moles of boron. And for hydrogen, we know that it's 1.01 grams for every one mole. Okay, and if I do that math, I end up with 18.75 moles of hydrogen. So the next step, it's said to divide by the smallest. So that probably really wasn't clear, but now if you watch, I bet it will become clear, okay? So now we have these two moles here. We have 7.5 moles of boron, 18.8 moles of hydrogen. So we're going to divide by the smallest number of moles, okay? So 7.502. So just the top and the bottom, divide by the smallest number of moles. So what this ends up with is I have one this would be equal to 1 for boron. And what this ends up with for hydrogen is 2.5. And this tells me that for every 1 boron, I have 2.5 hydrogen. So these are not whole numbers. So what I need to do is multiply to get a whole number. Okay, so I'm just going to give us some more room. So I have 1 boron for every 2.5 hydrogen. So I'll say, let's just say times 2. So times 2, times 2, so 2, and now I have 5. Okay, so just multiply to get the smallest, so multiply by the smallest multiple to get whole numbers. In this case, 2 worked. Okay, so now I know my formula is this, so V2H5. This is my empirical formula. Okay, so that's our first step towards solving this. We have the empirical formula. 
So we're looking for the molecular formula. So the next thing we need to do is we need to get the molar mass of this. Okay, so our molar mass for B2H5, you would just say two times boron's molar mass, five times hydrogen's molar mass. Okay, so our molar mass here is gonna be 26.6 grams per mole. Okay, for our empirical formula. So it doesn't matter that this is the molecular formula, you can still find it the same way. Okay, now we want it to, we want to um, figure out the actual molecular formula. Okay, so we have our molecular formula, our, our molecular mass given, so 53.3 grams per mole. So 53.3 grams per mole. And what we want to do is we want to find out how many multiples of our empirical formula are in this. So 26.6 grams per mole is our, molecular, our empirical formula mass. Sorry, that's supposed to be a six. That's a little better. Okay, so divide those. It'll tell us how many times the empirical formula actually goes into the actual molecular formula. And it turns out two. Okay, so this number tells me to multiply my empirical formula by two. Okay, so I'll just say two times B2H5. So what I, my molecular formula turns out to be B2H4 or B24H10. Okay, so this is my molecular formula. Okay, so that's one way of finding, or that's how to find molecular formula given percent composition. Okay, and I will zoom out on this whole problem for you so you can see everything. Okay, so let's switch back over to the slides. Okay, so we finished this problem. And this is also typed out into the slides, so if you would rather have the text version of it, you can see it here. Okay, so moving on. So this last little bit we're gonna we'll go over is about chemical equations. So this will be our first sort of dealings with chemical equations. So what is a chemical equation? So it's a shorthand way of describing a chemical reaction. So we use chemical formulas to describe a chemical reaction. Okay, and they must have masses and charges balanced. So the mass, in other words, remember our conservation of mass. So if I put 10 grams in, I have to get 10 grams out. Well, we have to balance charges as well, and we'll get to that later. But for now, just know you have to balance the mass and the charges. Okay, they provide information about the reaction's formulas of reactants and products, states of the reactants and products, and the relative number of reactant and product molecules. Okay, so basically it's almost a recipe. You could kind of think of it that way. It's like a nice, easy, shorthand way of writing a recipe for a reaction that can be understood by someone else that knows how to speak chemistry, essentially. So if I'm a chemist and I want to explain how to, you know, what ratio to react things in to give us certain products, this is how I can describe it to other people. Okay, so they can also be used to determine the weights of reactants used and the amounts of product that can be made. So I, it can determine how much, you know, for instance, maybe I'm trying to make, um, I don't know, maybe I'm making methane, I don't know. Um, so I, I know that I have 10 grams of carbon, and I want to know how much hydrogen to react with that, and then I want to know how much methane that will, that will give me. Okay, so this is how I'm going to, this is how I would find that out. Okay, and we'll talk about how exactly to do that. Okay, so but because the same atoms are present in a reaction at the beginning at the end, the amount of matter of system the amount of matter in a system does not change. Again, our conservation of matter. So we talked about this one a lot. Okay, so because the principle of conservation of matter, the equation must be balanced. So a good chemical equation has to be balanced on both sides. That is to say, it must have the same number of atoms and the same kind of atoms on both sides. Okay, we know we call this particular part of chemistry stoichiometry, okay, and it's based solely on this idea of conservation of matter. 
So suppose we have a chemical equation. So here we have iron reacting with oxygen to give us iron oxide. So this equation tells me the following. I have four atoms of iron reacting with three atoms or three molecules of oxygen to give me two molecules of iron oxide. Or I could also say I have four moles of iron reacting with three moles of O2 to give us two moles of iron oxide. So these coefficients, and we call these stoichiometric coefficients, these coefficients tell us not only for one reaction of this, so in other words, um, four atoms plus three molecules gives us two molecules, but it can also be used to talk about it in terms of moles. Okay, so the, co the coefficients tell you not only atoms and molecules, but it also tells you moles. So this could also be, so this could be four atoms of iron, or it could be four moles of iron. Okay, just depending on what's the right context for the situation you're in. Okay, so it depicts the kind of reactants and the products and their relative amounts in a reaction. So I know that if I react four moles or four atoms of iron with three moles or three atoms or three molecules of oxygen, I'm going to get two moles or two molecules of iron oxide. Okay, so it tells me what kind of things I'm reacting. It also tells me what I'll get out and how much. Okay, we can refer to these the numbers up front and of the atoms as stoichiometric coefficients. Okay, then we have the letters, um, and these are all lowercase, S, G, L, and A, Q. S for solid, G for gas, L for liquid, and most of the time you will see L's in cursive, like this. Okay, just to, so that people understand they're not ones. Okay, then we have aqueous, which is A, Q. And aqueous just means that it's dissolved in the water. So it just means that the solution, or the solvent that the solution is made from, is made from water. Okay, so some chemical reactions do not go to completion, but reach a state where the forward rate of the reaction is the same as the reverse rate of the reaction. So we call this being an equilibrium. And the equilibriums can lie heavy to product side, or it can lie heavier to reactant side. It just depends on the system and the conditions that system are in. Okay, so when writing a chemical reaction that's in equilibrium, we use this double arrow. Okay, so this means that the reaction moves in both directions. So if we put it, we'll talk about Le Chatelier's principle later, but if I put this reaction in certain conditions, it will maybe lie more towards the reactants, and if I put it in different conditions, it may lie more towards the products. Okay, well, and we'll talk about that when we get to uh, further in, into the class. Okay, and that's called the Shotley's principle. Okay, but just so you, if you see double arrows, that way you kind of understand. Okay, so the point of this section is basically to learn how to balance chemical equations. So I'm gonna, I'll show you how to do one of these, and then I'll give you all of the correct coefficients for the blanks, um, and essentially it will be up to you to practice this. I can show you the method to do it, but unless you practice it, there's really nothing I can do to make it easier. In other words, I, I you know, you kind of, it's just one of those things you have to practice. So let's look at the first one. So just like we did before, we'll go over to Notepad and we'll look, take a look at the first one here. So I'll show you my method, um, and then if you have something, a way to do it better, or a way that you've been taught otherwise, that's okay too. I'm just going to show you how I do it. Okay, so I have our problem set up nicely for us. And now we just want to balance this. So again, this is my method. There are other ways to do it. So what I like to do is write out the reaction, just like we have it here, and then just to list the things that are in the reaction. Okay, so I'll say we have carbon, because we have carbon here. Try to write that up a little bit cleaner. Sorry, this is our reaction arrow. Okay, so we have carbon, we have hydrogen, and I'm just moving from left to right. And any time I get to something I haven't previously written down, I'll write that down. So next I have oxygen. And if I take a look on my right-hand side, my so these are my reactants. Just so if I say these terms, you'll know. And these are my products. Okay, So reactants are the left, products on the right. 
So now if I look on my product side, I have the same elements. And that's good. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. And that's good. If I didn't, I would have a problem with creating matter, essentially. I would be creating atoms if I, or destroying atoms. But since I have the same thing on both sides, okay, we're good to go. So then we can balance this. So what we want to do is we want to make it so that the atoms coming in on our reactant side are equal in number to those on the product side. So they have to be the same atom and they have to be in the same numbers. Okay, so now what I'll do first is just total up the atoms on each side. So here I have three carbon, eight hydrogen, two oxygen. Don't forget your coefficients. Okay, those still apply. Okay, then over here I have one carbon, I have three oxygen, and I have two hydrogen. Okay, so I need to get these numbers, so this number, this number, to be the same. This number and this number to be the same, this number and this number to be the same. In other words, whatever I put in, I need to get out, and whatever I get out, I have to have put in at some point. Okay, so how can we start? Well, right away I see that I have a 2 and an 8. Okay, and I could remedy this maybe by putting a number somewhere around in here to, give, to make these match. So what if, for instance, and this is kind of a guessing game, it's almost a puzzle. So if you're like maybe a, a, Sudoku, a person that likes Sudokus or something like that, um, you might like this a lot actually, because it's kind of a puzzle. So now I have to look at the effects of adding that number here. So the only thing it's changed, well one thing it's changed, four, so 4 times 2 gives me 8, so now I have 8 hydrogen, but it's also changed the number of oxygens. So now I have 2 plus 4 oxygens, so I don't have 3 anymore, now I have 6. Okay, and it hasn't affected my carbon at all, simply because I didn't put anything there. So now I see that I have 3 carbon on my reactant side and only 1 carbon on my product side. And I also see that my carbon is attached to my oxygen, and then I have oxygen by itself over here. So that might be a good opportunity to balance this because I can basically put any number in front of CO2 and balance the oxygens out with this oxygen on the left. So why don't I try that? So what if I just do this? What if I put a three here? Okay. Now I have three carbon and I have six plus four oxygen. So three times two is six. Four times one is four. So now I actually have 10 over here. Okay. So now my oxygen is no longer balanced. Okay, so what do I need to do? Well, like I said, I have oxygen all by itself over here. So I could just, maybe I need, I need 10. So why don't I add a five here? So now this is 10. Now if I go back and I double check, three, three, eight, eight, 10, 10. So now everything is balanced on both sides. So I have a balanced equation. And if for some reason, so I started with a four in front of water. If for some reason that wasn't right, just erase it and try a different number. Okay, there's nothing wrong with your first guess being wrong. And sometimes you'll get so frustrated with one of these, and the best thing to do is just to erase everything and start over. And that's perfectly fine. And maybe try a different tactic or try a different, uh, you know, different numbers until you eventually you can get these balanced. Um, and if you can't balance it, then there's something wrong with the equation. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. And I will show you the solutions for this set of equations. And this way you can practice them. Um, and hopefully you'll get better at balancing equations. So make sure you can do this. This is something that from here on out in this class, if you see a chemical equation, one of the very first things you should always do is check to see if it's balanced. Because if it isn't, you need to balance it um, in order for it to be correct. So I'll leave these on the screen uh, for a few moments so that you can write them down um, and you'll have them to use. Okay, and that will be um, everything for chapter three. So this is the last chapter on your first exam, so make sure you're getting ready for that. Um, I will try to post up any worksheets I have um, that will help you practice balancing and this sort of thing. I think I have some. Um, before the exam, that way you can use them to practice.